today we are in our second message on the wall. It's a study in the book of Nehemiah. Just three messages, but I just believe God's going to use it in a wonderful way. You know, the scripture says in Proverbs chapter 30, 14 and verse 34, the scripture tells us godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Another translation says um, righteousness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about walls and fences and building strong walls of righteousness for our families and for our society. Uh, I have a few pictures that I picked out this week to illustrate how we protect our children with walls as they grow. The first one is this picture of, this happens to be the little daughter, the brand new daughter of Robert Madu and his wife Taylor. Isn't she gorgeous? Yeah, she had her eyes closed for that shot, but she's an infant. Now, you got to know some folks, that little girl isn't going anywhere unless her parents pick her up. Uh, there are some strong bars on either side of that shot that you're not seeing, but I'll guarantee you she's not getting out of the, She's not rolling off into the abyss. Her mom and dad will lift her out until she's able to walk. Now, here's another kind of, well, I call this the uh, child behind bars uh, wall. If we could see that next one real quickly. This one right here is of the toddler. He starts to become a toddler, and they just have to live behind bars. There's no, they're just everywhere. And if you don't put some kind of protective wall, they're just going to, they'll crawl into a fire. You know, they'll crawl into the dog pen. They'll crawl anywhere. They're just going to get in some trouble. I love this one. I think I call this uh, three uh, kids in a pen. All right. Uh, if you want to go to the water, you're not going to the water without a pin around your lives. We're not letting you get out of here unless mom and dad are nearby. This is an unusual picture. This is the picture of the wall that starts to break down and the kids are going to escape the wall. But isn't that marvelous that mom and dad are on the other side of the fence and you can almost see mom there going where do you think you're going so you broke the fence down I still have you you're going nowhere here's another kind of fence this is called the Sunday school class fence this is where we begin to build a protective wall of righteousness so the devil can't get in. We're going to talk about this kind of a wall and building this wall today. Here's a sad picture. This is the picture of a little boy inside a half put together wall that no one seems to be minding whatsoever. Things are torn about and there he stands wondering what do I do next. That's not the kind of wall that I want to build for my children or my grandchildren or the next generation. Can you say amen, church? That's what we want to talk about today. And I'd like for you to follow along in your notes or open your Bibles if you brought your Bible and follow along with me today from the book of Nehemiah, the second message, chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 6 through 14. Nehemiah is speaking. Uh, he's the builder of this wall around Jerusalem, and he's speaking. He says, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all of their heart. Another translation said, had a mind to work. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. 
But we prayed to our God and posted a guard and night to meet the threat, day and night to meet the threat. Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came, I love this, and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Wow, what a leader. Every team needs a leader. Every nation needs a leader. Every university needs a leader. Every school needs a leader. Every business needs a leader. Every church needs a leader. Today, I want to look at this second message and I've entitled it, Lord, Strengthen My Hands. Lord, Strengthen My Hands. The wall that Nehemiah built uh, in 52 days, rebuilt this wall around Jerusalem in 52 days, was a physical wall. And this physical wall protected the people of Israel from intruders. People that oughtn't be there were kept out by the wall. I read this past week, if you can believe this, I just saw a notice came up on my feed on my phone, I think from CNN, that one of the sportscasters, are, now get ready, this is a crazy story, one of the famous sports catchers on one of the networks was in Montana, you may have read this, doing a story and went to a bar and got smashed drunk and got so drunk that he didn't know where he was and evidently the Uber driver dropped him at the wrong address and people were asleep in their home and heard some ruckus at the front door but then didn't think anything else of it, went back to sleep. The next thing the owner of the house heard was the door to the room next to their room slam. Whew. He flew out of bed. It didn't say, but probably had a baseball bat, but he flew out of bed, opened the door, and <laughs> the sportscaster was naked laying sound asleep on the bed, snoring, drunk, smashed drunk. They had left their front door open, unlocked. This guy didn't know where he was. He's in a strange state. He doesn't know anybody. He's in a strange state. He's been drinking, shows up at the wrong door, wrong place, wrong night, wrong state. What? That's open. Must be where I'm supposed to go. Goes in and goes to bed. The cops came. They fined him for a misdemeanor. He didn't hurt anybody. He didn't know where he was. He was drunk. But a lock on the door would have kept intruders out. Hello? Uh, a strong wall of protection will keep enemy forces out. Whether it's a nation that's coming against one's nation, especially in historical olden days, or maybe even your home. I remember in 1976, this is a true story, Robin and I were, had only been married for three years. We were very young. 
She was 22. I was 23, I think. Maybe I was 23. <laughs> anyway, I'm 23. She's 22. We're living in Sacramento, California. You can Google this. Not today when you get home or when you're eating in the cafe afterwards. But 1976, the area of Sacramento we lived in experienced a rapist. In fact, this man became known as the East Area Rapist. And from 1976 until 1978, two full years, in our area, this man raped 45 different women. He killed 12 of them. They believe he was the reason for 120 different robberies in the area. During this time of two years, 6,000 different men in our city were suspects and were interviewed by the police. Over 40 of them were police because this man seemed to know the movement of the police, where they would be, where they would be stationed, and when, and wherever he hit, there were no cops within miles of that place. They never found the man, ever. And last year was the 40th anniversary, and a major article was written by one of the editors of the Sacramento Bee saying, that the city of Sacramento still lives in fear of this rapist. And Robin's shaking her head, yes, because we were in that little area where this was happening. And I had a baseball bat by the bed, and we bought an extra lock and bolt for our front door. We had our back doors bolted in. But then at night, she would not let me go to sleep until... We'd lock, we had a, we got, got a lock for our bedroom door, which, why would you need that? We didn't have any kids or anybody. We had a lock for our bedroom door. Every night, the two of us would struggle and push the 350-pound dresser drawers full of stuff. She filled it with more stuff to make sure it was heavy in front of that one door into our bedroom. For two years, every night, oh, God, yeah, God, this is one night, Robin. No, push it in front of the... Women were scared to death. We did everything we could to build a protective wall to protect our lives and our home from intruders that weren't wanted, like the naked sportscaster or from invading armies that we didn't want messing with our family in any way. Huh. But let me tell you something. Even though that wall created a feeling in Jerusalem of security, finally, Nehemiah was also, in my estimation, wanting to build a wall of righteousness back around the community. You see, for 70 years, Israel had been captive in Babylon. And then 92 years before this event takes place of rebuilding the wall, as I said last week, a group of people led by Zerubbabel and the prophet Zechariah were sent back by the king uh, that was over Babylon back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had burned down. But still, there's 92 years before the wall gets rebuilt by Nehemiah. But a number of years, probably another 50 or 60 years before this, Psalms 137 is written. I told you last week that most likely Ezra is the one that assembled the book of Psalms. David did not write every one of the Psalms 
Ezra wrote some of the Psalms. They believe that Psalms 137, the Jewish people believe that Jeremiah wrote that Psalm. You say, well, Pastor, what Psalm is that? Well, that's the one where the, the, the writer says they were requiring of us a song in a foreign land. But how could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? In fact, we took our harps, we people of Israel, and hung them on the willow trees. We quit singing. We couldn't sing a song in a foreign land. The foreign land was Babylon. They'd given up. This was probably written in 607 BC. Now, when you're being whipped and chained and brutalized and being treated like slaves, it's hard to keep your mind on things of righteousness. It's hard to pass on what you believe about God to your children. I mean, you are in a constant Dis disruption of, of, of what should be in life. And Nehemiah knew once he could get these walls that were physical walls rebuilt, he could get the spiritual walls going strong in people's families again. And friends, today it's the spiritual wall that has me concerned for our nation today. I believe with all of my heart, America is losing the spiritual wall of righteousness that we so desperately need. God is calling us as his people to put everything into the spiritual wall from now on until Jesus calls us home. When you endeavor to build a wall of righteousness around your family, there are three things that come from this text that I believe you need to remember. The first thing you need to remember when rebuilding or building a wall of righteousness around you and your family is this. Jesus is the source of your strength. Jesus Christ is the source of everything we do in this life. Nehemiah was in a bad spot. The Bible tells us that his workers were growing weary. The Bible tells us that Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the people of Ashdod began to plot against Nehemiah before the wall was complete in order to kill him and kill the workers on the wall. The Bible says in Nehemiah 4 and verse 17, the builders of the wall carried materials in one hand to build the wall and they carried a, a weapon in the other hand. They never left the wall, but they had themselves protected with a weapon. They were ready to work and they were ready to fight if need be to get this wall built and to build the wall of righteousness. What kept them going, church? I believe it's found in the Word of God, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14, part A. We read it earlier. Nehemiah says, After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Our God church is great and awesome. Our God is the source of everything we do and everything we have. It is our God because our God is great and awesome. Not your place of employment, not your job, not your boss, not your education, not how well you dress. Not the power brokers you know or don't know. No, no. You know him whom to know is life eternal. His name is Jesus and he is awesome and he is great. And no one is greater than our God. We need no other source but God alone. Once we have him, he will bring everything into our life that we need for success. When Nehemiah said these words, remember I said last week, Nehemiah is writing at the end of the age. He's writing at the end of the Old Testament. 
This happens around 444 B.C. You know that four, 44 years later, God silences himself for 400 years. And there is no voice from God between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew. So Nehemiah is writing at the end of the age. And when Nehemiah says, remember the Lord our God who was awesome. He's looking back into history. He might as well have been saying, you all remember Job, the wealthiest man in the East, who in one hour, one day, lost everything. But our God gave him back double for his trouble. Remember our God. He's, he's great. He's awesome. You remember those people, Sodom and Gomorrah, they thought they could get away with it. They thought they could spit in our God's face. He burned their cities down. Our God. You remember the flood. Those people thought they could rebel against our God. God flooded the world, destroyed the world, started the world over with Noah. You remember Noah? You remember that God took our people out of 400 years of bondage Egypt in one night. One night and fill their pockets with billions of dollars of money as they left Egypt in one night. You remember our God for our leader, Moses, split the Red Sea so that our people could walk over on dry ground and then crush the Egyptians who followed in. You remember our God is the one that took that little stone by the power of the Holy Ghost and guided that rocket force into the forehead of Goliath from the slingshot of David. It was our God that did. Remember, he's awesome. He's great. It was our God who just a few years ago shut the mouths of the lions for our beloved Daniel so that he walked out the next morning alive. Those lions couldn't. Our God is great. He is awesome. What are you afraid of, church? What is it that has you troubled? Remember our God. He is great. He is awesome. Trinity Church, I'm telling you today, I'm commanding you under the authority of the Holy Ghost, do your work for God with one hand and keep the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God in the other hand, and you will build a wall of righteousness around you and your family. If you believe it, say amen today. Amen. Hallelujah. Remember the Lord our God who is great and who is awesome. You can build walls to keep intruders and enemy forces out of your family. But don't forget to build doors and walls and locks to lock the devil out of your family as well. Tell the devil, devil, not today. Not on my watch. I will remember the Lord my God who is great and who is awesome. You have no part in this family, devil. Second thing I want you to remember is this. The purpose. Everybody say the purpose. The purpose in building a wall of righteousness around your home is to ensure your family legacy is part of the answer and not the problem. I don't want to raise up children who are a problem in society. I want to raise up a family who is the answer for society. Here's what Nehemiah said. First of all, remember the Lord your God is your source. But secondly, in Nehemiah 4, 14 part B. And fight... For your families, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. This is a fight to raise godly children. It's a fight to keep your marriage together. It's a fight to have a place to stay that is this wholesome environment where children, as in an incubator of spirituality, are matured in Jesus Christ. 
Hmm. The battle lines for every father, every mother, and every family is kids, marriage, and place to stay. Remember that order. When you get that order out of order, out of sequence, there's trouble. Remember, if your home, where you stay, you got, that's all you care about. Pretty soon the marriage gets weak. Pretty soon the kids are running all over. They got a beautiful place to live, but the kids are out of control. They're, they're, they're part of the problem in society. If your marriage is more important than your kids, that's a problem. That's a problem. Very, very serious when I speak this way. I, I know some of you are shocked. My wife isn't shocked. There were so many times that I wanted to leave my wife. I've been married 44 years. I can say what I want. <laughs> I'll guarantee you there's so many times she wanted to leave me. Just sick of, sick of him. Sick of her. Don't say that. Don't say that again. Don't say that again. I mean, I mean, just. And, and let me tell you something. More than her, the temptation was there for me. So easy. I was on the road for 18 years. Every week. Somewhere in America. Somewhere in the world. Yes, I had people travel with me. Yes, I did what the Bible says. Go out at least in twos. Stay in a group. But there was still ample opportunity to just mess up. And sometimes I get in the plan, I just be so upset. Somehow God kept us. Why did she stay with me? Why did I stay with her initially? For the children's sake. Because if I fail, and if she fails, to hand this gospel off to our children, we failed. In fact, Paul says to Timothy, how can you lead the church if your family's out of control? No, that's, the Bible says that. I'm not coming against any other brothers or sisters who haven't been able to keep it together. I'm just saying that's what he says. And I held that verse up in front of my face for 100 years. Robin kept it in front of her face. We'll stay together for those boys. You need to know that. That's the order. That, that's the order. Hmm. Here, here, just look, look at it with me. Just look, 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 at the, look, look at the diagram from Bible. Put it up there, guys. Number one, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Fight for your, it's a fight. Fight for your kids. Fight for your spouse. Then fight for your home. In that order. Folks, you cannot believe how many fights I had for and with my sons. I was fighting for them, but I had to fight them to fight for them. Argue, argue with their old man. Argue, argue. In fact, I, I don't, I'm glad none of you ever heard our arguments. Because I, I'm telling you right now, no cursing by the grace of God. Because those thoughts and words were in my brain. I'll tell you that. But no, no cursing. But if you'd have heard some of those, you'd go, oh, my dear God, Jesus. Our pastor, oh. Because I was fighting for their souls. The devil wanted their souls. He wanted to steal my boys. He wanted them for his side. He wanted them for hell's purposes. But not on my, I told the devil, not today. Every day I had to say, not today. Not, not this boy, not, no, devil, not today. Not today, not on this, not on my watch. Oh, my. And who do you think the worst of the four? Rich Jr. Oh, dear God in heaven. Oh, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, nose to nose. I'm spit and sweat. Yeah. 
Who do you think won? You're looking at him. Thank you very much. You're looking at her. Thank you very much. Yeah, we won. Because it's a fight. I'm not afraid of that devil. Jesus is my source. Now after that, it's a fight for my kids. The devil wants their souls. I'm going to fight for their soul. What do you think is happening right now? John Fulton's in for the fight of his life with his kids. He's safe. He's living for God. His wife, they're blessed people, but now they got kids and they're in a fight for their children. And Taylor, my baby, he's in a fight for his children. <laughs> in the month of January, Rich Jr., who knows all about raising kids, who knows all about that stuff. Brother Rich Jr. is going to have a little boy, God willing. And oh, he's in for a ride of his life. You talk about getting paid double for your trouble. Ho, ho, ho. He thinks he had arguments with me. Hello. It's a fight. It's a fight. Do not be afraid of the fight, church. And don't run from the fight. This is our life. This is our legacy. Our lineage. This is all we have. I don't care if you have a million dollars in the bank. It doesn't mean a blooming thing if your kids are living like hell for the devil. I'm telling you, I want my kids living for Jesus. Last of all. When you're building a wall of righteousness around the family, live with the constant prayer. Lord, strengthen my hands. Lord, strengthen my hands. Hmm. I want to make a statement here so you're clear from this point on. You've heard it said before. It's not over until it's over. But I say, when you think it's over, it's never over. Never. The fight is real. Let me tell you when it will be over. When you're in a casket at this altar and I'm standing at the head, that's when it will be over for you. Because this is a battle that will track you to the grave. Don't ever think it's over. It's when you think it's over, that's when the devil comes in with everything he's got. Hmm. In Nehemiah 6, as soon as the news is out that Nehemiah and the people have completed the wall, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the rest of the enemies wanted to have a meeting with him. Okay, we lost... And what we were trying to keep you from, we need to have a meeting. Let's meet. I got people in the front row dying laughing because we have had some stuff the last couple of weeks that's kind of funny to us. Now they want to meet with us. Well, their meeting was to kill him. I think those meetings should be held here from now on. Yeah, have them make the drive. Thank you wanted us to meet with him, he said. Okay. Why? Because the Bible tells you, read the whole story. They wanted to kill him. Yeah. They're going to kill him. Look what the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 9. They were all trying to frighten us. Thinking their friends will get too weak for the work. And it will not be completed. But I prayed. Now strengthen my hands. If you're going to say that my people's hands will get too weak to work, I'm leading these hands. So God, strengthen my hands. Oh God, give me the strongest hands in this whole nation so that my people's hands will be strong enough to fight this battle with me. They're not going to take us out, church. 
They are not going to win. We will win. We will win this battle. We will win on our watch. The wall will be completed. Righteousness will surround us. And in time, it will begin to surround Dade County. Right from this place, it will begin to surround all of Dade County. And it will become a protected place and not a scary place. That's my prophecy. It may not happen on my watch, but I pray that it does. I believe God that with God's help, he will strengthen our hands. Every time you say it, every time you pray it, you're saying, devil, not today. It's time to stop crying about what you've lost and start fighting for what you still have. Hallelujah. I'm not going to lose another thing on my watch, devil. Not today. Uh-uh. I got this wall built. I'm building it. I'll never stop building. I never believe it's over. I'll keep going until God calls me home. But God, strengthen my hands. Lord Jesus, whatever you do, strengthen my hands. You're a husband about to leave. You're a wife who's about to leave. What are you going to do? You're going to let him walk out? Are you going to say, good, good enough for you? Or are you going to look to heaven and say, oh, God, strengthen my hands. God, bring my wife back. God bring my husband back that son that daughter's running from God what are you going to say let him go they're from the devil anyway well they came from you say God strengthen my hands give me my boy back give me my daughter back on my watch God strengthen my hands hallelujah in closing I want to apologize to all of you. In the Christian world, around the world, the month of October is Pastor Appreciation Month. You have never known that because I have never made you aware of it in 19 years. But one of our seven core values is honor. In fact, we say honor is our calling. I'm getting ready to write a book on honor with Charisma Books. And I have failed to set a month aside where you could honor me. And I regret that. Because it's not about me, it's about you. It's about you learning to honor those in the lead position. The enemy knew, because the, the devil believes if he can cut the head off, the body will die. And they knew if they could kill Nehemiah, this guy who is so strong, and just, just all but just, we'll get a, get a weapon in one hand, work with the other hand. We're not leaving. But he said, I didn't, I didn't change my clothes the entire 52 days. Read it. It's in there. I never changed. The workers, and we never changed our clothes. We weren't going to leave the wall. Some slept. Some kept working. They'd sleep. The other was at work. We'd watch out for each other. We're not quitting. And, folks, we've done that for 19 years. We've stayed on the wall. God's blessed us. But I haven't taught you to pray for me like I should. I need you this month to decide I'm going to be an honorer of the pastor. I'm going to pray every day that God would strengthen Pastor Rich and Pastor Robin's hands. That you would honor every one of our pastors. You would learn to honor those who are in positions of spiritual leadership who are under attack. They, the enemy knows if he can take us out, some in the congregation will fall as a result of it. Not everybody, but some will. He'd love to do that. Tonight, I'm getting on a plane and leaving for Morocco. I've been chosen one of 30 American pastors, 30 American imams and 30 American rabbis to go to Rabat, Morocco to talk for the next four days. I'll be back Friday night, God willing, about bringing peace across 
the spiritual lines of different religions, all of which were based in the Middle East and their foundation occurred in the Middle East. How can we be at peace and not at war? And Sheikh bin Baya of Abu Dhabi is in his 90s, I believe. He is paying for everything. We'll meet him this week. I am one of three here in Dade County that are going on this trip. And there's 50 cities chosen in America to make this happen in America across the religions. Now, let, let me let you know that as I leave, I will not leave to compromise anything that I believe as a Christian. I believe the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, and I never will stop believing that. And if they ask me, I will tell them that while I'm there. But can't we say it in love? Can't I say it with a motivation of love that you need Jesus too, rabbi, imam? And I'm sure they'll be hitting me with what they've got. But we're going to do it in love, believing for peace. Now, I feel bad because Robin can't go with me on this trip. So I live tonight. Now all I care about is her. I don't care about the house. Kids don't care about us. They don't talk to us. <laughs> she's all I got. I'm all she's. We're, it is crazy love at this point. A couple folks. <laughs> crazy love. Hello. But thankfully, I'll be able to get off the plane in Paris, and Taylor will meet me there. They've asked Taylor to go from New York. Um, I'm not as young as I was 19 years ago when I first came here. But I believe because of your kindness and your understanding and your thoughtfulness, by the grace of God, I'm smarter, I'm wiser, and I even believe I'm stronger than I was 19 years ago. But only with your prayer, God, strengthen his hands this week. Can I make it? Strengthen his hands. Lord, help him to stand. And I'll promise you that while I'm gone, I will pray that for you. Lord, strengthen her hands. I've got my prayer list with me. People in this church, on my list. I'll be praying. For, I'll believe with you. We're going to build a wall of righteousness like never before. And we will not lose. We will win. Because remember our God. He is great. And he is strong. Can you say amen? Should you bow your head with me today?